put out a few posts during the week to see if people are still keen on throwing questions my way. And I've got a few really, really good questions there. Some of them are a little bit, little bit bizarre, I might say, Nicola, which the question is, if I was an animal, which legs would I wear my pants on? So I'll let that one sit with you for a little bit. But for those that are new here, my name's Kerry. I'm a veteran from the Australian Defence Force, a registered nurse and a wood turner. And on my channel here on YouTube, I like to share, and my social media, I like to share everything that I'm learning, going through to hopefully help out other people along their journeys or wherever you are in, in, in life. So yeah, that's, that's why I'm here. So let's get right into it and get to the questions. First question by Little Warrior Shields. Damien, if I had to choose only one chisel to work with, which would you choose? So the one chisel I always go to and I'm always using on my little nursing trolley is uh, the 16 millimeter bowl gouge. I've got two of them. It's a parabolic flute, uh, a 45 degree bevel with the heel removed and I always use it. It's my go-to tool. And reason being is because it's so versatile. You can do so much with it. That's, that's my choice, mate. Hopefully I answered your question there. Right, let's go. Trep, trep turnings. First time asking a question, mate. Thank you very much. Will you consider doing demos worldwide? And my answer is, I would love to. I would absolutely love to, but I wanna take my time with everything and I wanna be ready. So I wanna be at the point where I believe my turning is at the level where I can be a, a good demonstrator for people so I'm not wasting their time. But one thing, uh, and I'll get to these questions too about YouTube from Nathan, our little shed, is when I'm editing, there'll be moments when I'm turning, sorry, when I'm turning and I'm just staring at the camera thinking of the words to say. So. When it comes to editing, I can clip that minute out because I'm just standing there going, how do I describe what I'm doing right now? How do I put it into put it into words to help people understand exactly what I'm doing, what I'm feeling? How I think about it is if I'm going to do demonstrations, I want that to just come straight off the tip of my tongue. And I want be able, I want people to be able to understand what I'm feeling and what I'm what I'm doing. So I want to be at that level first before before I go and do it, but thanks for writing in, mate. Let's go to our little shed. Nathan, for YouTube, what are your goals and how do you get monetized? So I've broken your questions up, mate. There's a couple of other YouTube questions, but monetization is super tricky. It's really hard to get monetized on YouTube and I believe it all comes down to niching down. You've got to niche right down into your category, but I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Monetization, you need 1,000 subscribers, and there's a caveat to that too. You want, I want people, for me, I want people to be able to be watching my YouTube videos from start to finish. I want them to feel like they're getting a lot out of them and I'm giving people value. So I prefer to have a smaller audience than a, than a large audience and only 10% people watch my videos. So that's, that's where I feel about that. So just taking it slow works dividends in the end, I believe. That's my opinion. So a thousand subscribers and you need 4,000 hours of watch time. And now the watch time with 4,000 hours is across your channel. It's not just off one video. So that's why it's important and where I sort of went a little bit wrong at the start is to have a catalog of value to help people out. So having different videos and it's in a bit of a, it's in like a library. So when people come to your channel and they want to like a how to channel, um, for example, if I'm going to hang a door, if I'm going to fix a door in a house, how the next video would be how to install the hardware, the doorknob. So it's like a catalog. For me, it's like, how do I turn a bowl? How do I fix the cracks? How do I wet sand with Danish oil? Or how do I sand? And then how do I, how do I wet sand with Danish oil? So it's in a catalog of videos so people can come to you and it's a one-stop shop. So that's more on how to build those 4,000 hours of watch time. But you, you wanna always just give, 
give people value. That's, that's what my whole and sole thing is give people value. But for me, it's also documenting along the way. So that's, yeah, and then my goals is to just pass on everything I'm learning and sharing everything so I can help other people out. That, that's my goal, that's my mission statement for my YouTube channel. So hopefully that answers your question, mate, but thanks very much for writing in and I'll get to your other two about filming, editing and uploading in a second. Next question is by Rogan Woodworking and I appreciate you for writing in, mate. First time writing in to the, to the channel, so thank you so much. And I've also got, I'm gonna combine the two because they're quite similar. And this question is by Chris. Chris Long, long time viewer. You've been there since the start, mate, and I appreciate you so much. So, so Rogan Woodturning's question is, what advice would you have for wanting to take their part-time woodturning hobby or hobby to a full-time job? And Chris's question, since you made the change to full-time turning, how have you found the change? Also, do you have any advice when approaching cafes to sell your products? I'm gonna combine those two questions because they're very similar. And first of all, I'm, I'm not full-time in my wood turning. I, I, I wanna keep my registration as a registered nurse. I worked so bloody hard to become a registered nurse and I believe it's it's something deep within me and about caring for people. So that that really does fulfill me and I wanna maintain that. And to maintain that, you have to keep shifts. I do know, cause I get mentorship of other full-time wood turners and they do, and we all know, they do other things. They will not only turn, lots of product but they also do schooling as well so they teach people and they make other things like digital products um, and they travel the world doing demos so that's that's that full-time full-time level so to answer chris's and rogan's question it has to be right for you i believe it has to suit your situation and it's got to feel like right i can now step into that next level of where you will need to be. You're, you're obviously bringing in enough, you're, you're getting enough coming in from your turning to then go, right, I'm going to step into full-time. And that's a personal thing. I can't answer that question for you. I'm, you know, um, And that's me being 100% honest. That's how, that's just how it is. When I was going through my nursing and the reason why I went and started to drop back doing other things is because I was in a bit of a hurt locker with, with other things that were going on within my life. And I turned to wood turning as my solace, as my place of just escapism, I guess. And I began to fall more in love with my turning. And that's why I'm so bloody passionate about it. And it just snowballed from there. And I just kept going down and down in that rabbit hole in a good way, good way. And I just kept going into it and going harder at it. And that's, that's how I ended up where I am now. And it just works, works for me and what, where I am. One thing that I will, I've got a few notes here that I wanted to, cause I wanted to get this right. Getting your name out there, and, but for both, for anyone, getting your name out there and how I've done it and how I went about doing it is just lots of social media. I'm across Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, X and threads, and I try and post on them as much as I can. And, but at the moment, it's just a little bit overwhelming. So I try and just focus my energy on Instagram and YouTube. And also in Lauren's question later on, when you have a product, I don't know if anyone saw my red stringy bark bowl just recently. I just took some photos of holding my bowl and, and moving it around just so people could get a dimension of it and just wrote a quick little description and for sale and the hashtags that relate to, sometimes it's got to relate to not only just wood turners because you'll find most wood turners won't actually buy other wood turners bowls, but you've got to branch out a little bit and do things like handmade decor for me, Australian decor or Australian homes, things like that will get other people's interest outside of wood turning to look at your products to then realize, hey, this person's making handmade one of a kind things 
let's let's look into it more. And I do find that I get sales through just doing simple little things like that. But getting your name out there with social media is imperative. You have to get you have to get on board and just take photos and put it up and post it out there. But one thing on that I would add is don't rush it. Don't feel like you have to just go holus bolus into all this and, and go full steam at it. What I found is you need that speed to be able to, to produce a lot of items quickly, but maintaining quality. Quality is key to all of this because the first thing I do when I pick up another wood turner's pieces, I'm looking around it and I'm, I'm judging it. I'm, that's just the way we are. We're human. We're humans and we're wood turners. We're craftsmen. We want to see the beauty, but we also, we know what we're looking for. And you might see tool marks, torn grain. So just take your time with it and get real proficient at the small things. Nadine, she, she might giggle in a minute, but it's the small things that matter when it comes to our craft. So taking your time, and there's a saying, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, the Navy SEALs. And it goes hand in hand in what we do. So taking your time with those little cuts, learning how to perfect those cuts, your sanding technique, well then the time will drop because that finished product off the gouge is just so much better. And then the sanding time will drop, then eventually your turning time will drop because you're getting more proficient at that. And what used to take an hour or two will only take you 20 minutes to put punch out a bowl. When it comes to all that and that social media, just set your phone up and put it on time-lapse. Time-lapse is really cool and people love watching, I love watching time-lapses. And just set the phone there, filming a time-lapse session of what you're doing. And that'll get people interested in how you're doing and how you're making your products. When it comes to getting your stuff out into the public, coffee shops, Chris, first of all, I am friends with the, my local coffee shops simply because I go there enough to ask them. And I felt confident at the time to ask them, would you guys be interested in having some wood turned pieces in here? I, you know, I'm, I'm a wood turner and I would love to put pieces in here, either on consignment, so they get a percentage of the sale, or you help them with their ATM fees because they get charged a fee when they use the ATM, or something like that, and just work it out with them. Another one that I heard is people selling chopping boards to real estate agents, so when they sell a house, they give a chopping board to people. You could doing a handmade bowl for their, new, for their clients that buy their homes. Two really important points is having a mentor, having someone that you can you can look up to and you can you can follow and just bounce ideas off. Um, even if you have to pay sometimes for that advice, but if you think about it like this, if you pay for that advice, you skip all of that. You skip all of that in between. So just something like that might help you out and skipping all those steps. So the one thing that I will also add to Chris and Rogan Woodworking's question is having someone in your corner. And Phil Lyon said, behind every good wood turner is even a better partner. And I couldn't agree more with that. You need someone in your corner that's gonna back you, that's gonna push you, that is gonna pick up one of your pieces and analyze it and, and give you honest feedback, critiquing it, looking over it, studying it for tool marks and for me that's my wife Dino as you all know you need someone in your corner because this this is hard it's really hard to do what we do and it's long hours frustration injuries you know people people don't see the value in what you're doing and it, it just there's a lot of setbacks but having someone in your corner they're just going it's all right they just weren't, they weren't right at the time, go somewhere else, you know, keep going. You know, I, I can still see scratch marks, I can see tool marks. You need to go and sand it a little bit more and don't take it as a, as a personal thing. It's, it's helping, helping you out. So without, without Dino, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in the situation I'm in and I'm extremely grateful to be able to be doing what I'm doing because I wouldn't be doing any of it without her. So that, that, that's everything, that's the bedrock. And 
Yeah. So hopefully that answers your questions, lads. And uh, just let me know, you know where you can reach me. But also on, on that, I'm thinking about writing out a newsletter maybe once a month. I'm struggling enough with all the videos and everything else I'm doing, the odds and ends, but a newsletter once a month just to let people know what I'm up to, where I'm, where I'm, what I'm doing and little tips and tricks and things I'm learning and also having things in there for, for sale like bowls and platters, but I know that a lot of wood turners won't buy other wood turners stuff, but might have blanks and things in there and, and you know, just things that I'm doing. So let me know if that's something you're interested in. It won't be a full salesy newsletter and pumping it out once a week or every second day. Once a month thing, and just sharing what I'm learning and, and good videos because when I'm sanding and stuff, I'm watching and le learning other things. So I'd like to share those videos that I'm learning as well. So Righto, so Lauren's question. I'm just starting with selling bowls and my smaller items. I have my first table rented on the 17th of November. So congratulations on that, Lauren. So I'm excited and a little nervous. Did you have any advice for selling as for selling to the public? Thank you for writing in for the Q&A this month and so first thing hopefully I covered a fair bit when I spoke about Chris's question as well as Rogan Woodworking's question covered a fair in, bit in there about selling things and you know how to go about it and how to get your name out there but also one of the most important things you want to make sure is you're covering your costs and not undercut yourself and a simple way of working out the cost of an item is, I made a video a while back when I approached Richard Raffin with a pricing formula, is do the diameter of your piece, the diameter of the bowl, have it sitting on the table, and then the depth, and it's in inches, so diameter by the depth times in inches, and then times it by 3.5 or three, whatever sort of works for you in where you are at the moment. and see how that works and make sure it's covering your costs. Let me know if that helps you out and if you want any more information on that, just write me a message. Next thing is, so I was absolutely packing myself when I went and did my first showing up at the Stone House, at, up at Moore. And what really helped me out in, in showing my passion for what we do and, and you know what we go about doing on, on a day to day when we're turning or, you know, is having little bits and pieces on the table. So I had some gouges there. I had my golden ratio calipers there so I could talk to people and how, how things are sized up and how I go about doing my craft. And I have them on the table, the gouges I would tape, tape the ends so no one can, can cut themselves. But having things there on the table, when people pick up a bowl or they pick up the gouge, for example, you can then say, that's, that's my, you know, 12 mil gouge that I use or you know or well, that's what I use to cut this and then they can see the passion and then you can have talking points so when other people look over at your booth you're there engaging with other people and talking about things that are on the table and then it just invites more people to come over and then they can listen in and then they can see the passion because we create one-of-a-kind things we're a very niche craft and we don't mass produce things and it's all done with these hands, with our hands and our, and our love and our, our designs. So just ha have trust yourself and back yourself in, in what you do. And as long as you know you're putting your best foot forward and within your pieces, you can't go wrong. And having those items there just invites that conversation. So that's I, I really enjoyed that part about it. Another thing that I wanted to mention is having just, I know this is very, very vain of me, but having a poster there so people can see, I'll take a photo of this and put it up on the community page, but having a, a blurb there so people can sort of read about your little bit of a bio, uh, a QR code so people can scan it, little flyers that you can give out so people can find you. And on the back I have care instructions, so it doubles as, so when someone purchases something, you can put it in the bowl and then it's got care instructions on the back and your website, bits and pieces, your social stuff. But uh, that's a big head, isn't it? But yeah, just a, just a quick little spiel on who you are. And I've, I had that just on the, on the, at the front, actually, because mine was a, a walk-in one. You could walk in and I made it like a U-shape, as well as I had tiers. So I had different levels. So different levels create and invite people in 
to, to see what you have on offer. One, one other thing is just make sure that your insurance is all covered. I'm not too sure of what they need or what they require, but some places want you to have insurance. Like I'm not an expert on any of this, just public liability and product liability type stuff. Um, here in Australia, if anyone's interested in looking into that, there's the Woodworkers of Victoria or Victorian Woodworkers Association, I believe, I forgot the proper name, I'll put it on the screen. They have insurances that you can purchase and then it covers you for all of that. So something to look into in the future, but yeah, just, just check and make sure that you know, you're covered as well. So, so hopefully I've answered your question there, Lauren, and um, good luck and I wish you all the best and please let me know how you go with your first festival. I'm really interested and I'm sure everyone else will as well and I'll put it up on the community post. Just anything that you learn from it as well, let us know and I'd be super keen to hear how you went. So thank you so much for writing in. Next question by Rod Miller. I would be interested in different ways you could do accent features if you do them. Saw the milk paint. I'm more of a grain nut, so I don't really like stuff that covers the grain. I've done segmented rings, twisted wire, mill put. Do you ever do art pieces, stitching cracks? Hope some of these might be helpful. Rod, thank you very much for writing in, Rod. I really appreciate it, mate. And to answer your question, I do the milk paint, and that's pretty much as far as I go with doing milk paint. I also do the coffee grounds, and sometimes I use the pigment the powdered pigment for doing resin in cracks, but it all depends on, you know, how fancy I want to go. But with the milk paint, I put it on, because those bowls are actually pine. So it's slash pine and they're quite plain, but they've got that real greeny color within it. And it's not super appealing. So that's why I use the, that timber particularly. And the wire brushing with the milk paint just adds a bit of flair to it. So that's as far as, as I go, but I am looking at purchasing U-Butte polishes, have some dyes, some coloring, and adding a bit of that to some of my pieces as well. But hopefully that answers your question, Rod, but that's as pretty much as far as I go. I have seen stitching before and I think it's really cool, but uh, yeah, thanks for riding in, mate. Our little shed, Nathan. So, something to do with YouTube. What's the process of uploading, filming, editing? And what have you learnt so far? So. At the start, I just started filming. So I'm gonna mix all this up a little bit. When I started filming, I just went out there and started filming whatever I was doing. And that goes with the advice of a lot of YouTube experts that say, or people that help other YouTubers, is start filming whatever you're doing. And then you will soon find what you enjoy filming and just do that with, with, with your phone. My biggest advice is don't go out there and buy super expensive equipment. The main things that you wanna look for is, is good audio, have good audio coming through, and just a clear area that people can see you. And that goes hand in hand with my other thing that I like doing about filming, is I have three cameras that I bought on the cheap. One is my phone, so two cameras. One on the roof, which is my phone looking down, one in front and one coming in to whatever I'm doing. And I prefer to do that because I put myself in the position of the viewer and whatever I'm doing, I wanna see what, what I'm doing. So that gives me the option to switch between the cameras when I'm turning and you can see exactly what's going on. And when I'm talking to you, I feel rude when I'm just talking and you can't see or look at me. So I prefer to have one out the front there that I can look up and, and talk to you when I'm, when I'm doing or when I'm explaining something. So that's what I prefer to do. The other reason why I like using and going to a lot of effort is because I want these videos to be on YouTube for a long time so people can use them as a resource. So back to what I said earlier in creating that catalog, I wanna be good from the get go because when someone looks for this video or looks for a video of mine in five years time, the quality is there. That's what I prefer to do. And it's a very slow growth way of doing things because you're not just pumping out three or four videos a week and low production value. I would prefer to do one good quality video a week or one good quality video a fortnight where I've got the three cameras and you can see absolutely everything that's going on that's, that's me. So in 10, 20, 30 years time, it's still got that real good quality to it. 
When it comes to the editing, I just use Premiere Pro as well as Adobe Express. So it all comes under, under Adobe products and I've got like a Creative Cloud account which allows me all these different products that they have with, with a one, you know, a subscription fee, as well as the music that I use on my videos is part of Epidemic Sound, not sponsored by anyone of this, but it's part of Epidemic Sound and they are a non-copyright, so I can't get copyright fines for the music that I use, and that's very important. But YouTube itself have music that you can use on your videos and you can't get in trouble for it. So can't get copyright fines. And once I'm done editing, I then upload it. Uploading is super simple. You export it out of your Premiere Pro. There's heaps of other YouTube channels out there. They make videos on this. Export it and then upload it to YouTube. You have to have a YouTube account and then you just hit upload and it will drop down box, make a title and then come up with a thumbnail that I use Adobe Express for, for making my thumbnails. But the title, you gotta be, see this is where you can, it's a thin line. There's a lot of clickbait out there, when you, which means when you click on the video and you start watching it, it's got nothing to do with what the actual title was about. I try and be honest with my titles. You gotta add a bit of spice and a bit of fluff, a bit of YouTube fluff in your title to get people wanting to watch your videos. If you know, that if you wanna help people out, you gotta get them enticed to, to watch it. And what have I learned so far is just to enjoy what you're doing. Film, just start filming videos and just do as many as you can and get that out of your system and then become 1% better with each upload. And then you will start finding your feet. So I thought the weekly wrap would be my thing for, you know, that would be my thing. But I started to really enjoy doing my wood turning and filming wood turning and I th that's helping more people out instead of just covering such a broad thing with wood turning life in a Q&A. It's very broad. There's also another caveat to that where you have an audience and you put out tutorials or something like that to help people, but you also make community content. So like this, like you watching this right now, you're my true mate who wants to see this Q&A. So that's why you watch it. And that's part of, you're part of my community of, of people that wanna be there for me and we all support each other. Community content and, and sort of a broader part of content. So you have to think about those two things as well. So hopefully that answers your question, mate. And uh, yeah, I wish you all the best. Mr. Taco, AKA Stuart, wrote in and asked, why did you choose the coring system you did? So. Long story short, I am part of the Wood Turner Society of Southeast Queensland, and when I I got invited to a pretty much a garage sale, Wood Turner was selling off a lot of their stuff, and I purchased the real old school woodcut bowl coring system, and it was well worn before I got it, and I worked it out even more. But it eventually, I was going through some Aussie hardwood, and it snapped, and the blade shot up onto the roof, and it was just a mess. So that's where I first got it, and then I just fell in love with bowl coring. And in one of my old weekly wrap videos, I put it out there and asked Woodcut Tools if they would help me out with the Max 4 bowl saver. And Jen and Dan, the owners of Woodcut, they came to the table, and they're absolutely lovely people. Uh, and they offered me a Max 4 bowl saver and I haven't looked back and I haven't really bothered to try any other bowl coring systems because I haven't needed to because the Max 4 just does everything that I need and it's easy to use and super safe. So, And I'm not just saying that because they helped me with it, I'm saying that because that's what I genuinely believe in. But uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question Stuart. Everyone out there that has gotten to this point in the video Thank you so much for stopping by and, and watching this video with me and, and going through what I've been talking about and, and uh, hopefully you've gotten something from the video. I wanna ask just one thing from everyone that's gotten to this point. If you know anyone out there that would be interested in watching some of my videos or you think it might help them along their journey, it would do me a massive, it would help me out a lot if you shared a video or two to someone out there that would be interested in learning a little bit more and, and coming along with the journey, that would help me a lot. So if, if you could help me out there, that I'd, I'd really, really appreciate it. And it helps me out, helps the channel and, and just, yeah, gets things going for all of us. 
But uh, I appreciate your time and, and thank you for, for watching it all the way up until this point. So I will talk to you and see you all directly. Have a lovely day or evening or morning. Cheers.